said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's son, our brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are now to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What are you looking for? We hear this question in some form many times every day. We hear it from shop clerks, from realtors and car salespeople. We ask it of our children, our spouses, our employees, and our employers. You knock on a coworker's door someday and they look up and say, yes, may I help you? The server comes to your table and says, do you know what you want? The telemarketer calls during dinner or during your commute, but you finally cut them off in mid-sentence to ask if this is not a robocall. Can you just tell me what you want? A more literal translation of what Jesus asks is, what are you seeking? Now my mother, the English teacher, would have preferred this version, thus avoiding ending the sentence, with a preposition. But either way, Jesus is asking a simple yet profound question. What are you looking for? What are you seeking? What do you want? Jesus asks. A simple question, unless the one seeking it is the Son of God, the Lamb of God who is here to take away the sins of the world. What do you want? You would think these budding disciples would muster something more profound like, we want to know the meaning of life. What's it all about? We want to understand how to square a good God with the bad things that happen in the world. We want to know what the future holds. But not these two disciples. What do you want, Jesus asks, and their reply, we want to know where you're staying. This looks like a blown opportunity. You've got the son of the living God writing you a blank check, giving you the chance of a lifetime to tell him what you want, and all you could come up with is, so where are you hanging your hat these days? But that's just at first blush. The fact is, these two disciples, they didn't blow it. They didn't give a bad answer. They weren't asking if Jesus was laying his head at the Hampton Inn. What do you want, Jesus asked. In a way, their reply was, we want you. What's that line from the old African-American spiritual? You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. They wanted Jesus. They wanted to be where he was, wherever that was. They wanted to follow where he led, even though John's words about the lamb who takes away sin probably tipped them off that where this Jesus would lead wouldn't be up to the top of any of the world's pyramids, but down into sacrifice and death. Nevertheless, they wanted Jesus. Where are you staying, they said. Come, and you will see, Jesus replies. He didn't issue a bunch of prerequisites, didn't make them jump through some moral hoops before letting them take what were quite literally their first steps of discipleship. 
Jesus didn't say, first you have to see me in full faith, and only then may you come along with me. That's sometimes the way we frame it. Come and talk to us after you have your act together. Come and join us after we're sure that you've got your spiritual and moral vision clear. Jesus says, come and then you'll see. So they did. A simple question and a simple invitation and the disciples went. And I don't know just what those two saw that first evening, but for Andrew, at least, it was enough for him to run at the crack of dawn the next day to find his brother Simon. We found the Messiah, Andrew impossibly claimed. And so Andrew brought his brother to the Lord. Jesus liked this Simon fellow from the first, which is why he immediately gave him a new name, one that would stick forever. Simon, Jesus said, I'm going to call you, translated, rock. Because even though Jesus could see that this Simon was an impetuous, tempestuous bundle of nerves and energy, This man also had a solid core of love and faithfulness that would make him the rock on which Jesus could one day build his church. And so began the gospel. So began the church. So began that little clutch of disciples whose devotion to their master would, against all odds, go on to change the whole world. Somehow it all began when two disciples answered the ultimate question, what do you want? With the simply profound and profoundly simple answer, we want you, Jesus. So what do you want? That's not a question from a long ago day addressed to people we've never met. It's always a today question. What do you want? Well, we want success, a spot in the limelight, our 15 minutes of fame, lots of likes on Facebook and followers on Instagram, a piece of the good life, financial security to be noticed. We want the kinds of things that someone describes as a lamb is unlikely to lead us to. We want the rewards of this world. Actually, we want more than that and sometimes less than that. When I go to the grocery store, the person at the checkout always asks, did you find what you were looking for? And by this, I am being asked if I found the peanut butter I wanted and were there enough apples to choose from to suit my needs. Can you imagine the look on this person's face if I said, No, I didn't find world peace or a cure for the common cold or the perfect job or free groceries for life. But the question Jesus asks really isn't about these kinds of needs or wants that I can find at the grocery store or even about the trappings of this world. It's about what only Jesus can offer. Now we know our culture, our world is looking for something desperately. Lurking behind all the scheduled chaos that fills our modern life is a deep hunger gnawing away in the deepest part of our being. Some may not acknowledge it, but most of us are searching for something more in our lives. Still others, so consumed by their spiritual hunger, in frustration have at least become church dropouts yet yearning to discover something more to fill the awful emptiness deep inside the soul. Perhaps it's the quest to fill that emptiness which has created today's boom market of the spiritual quick fix. In contemporary marketplace, spirituality is a major consumer item. When the spiritual ache twinges or empty soul growls, We can run to the closest bookstore or website or podcast 
to buy or download the newest hot seller on the spiritual fulfillment list. Unfortunately, many are so confused about what they're looking for, they end up collecting spiritualities like other people collect stamps or coins. On the other hand, we encounter, or on the one hand, we encounter the new age seekers with their crystals and pyramids and animal spirit guides, herbal potions and dream shapers or dream catchers. Their promise, we can provide the missing spiritual spark in your technological, time-ticking daily schedule. Now, my curiosity was grabbed by a recent sermon title on a church sign that I pass almost every day. The preacher's topic, An Idiot's Guide to Christianity. But on the other hand, there's a different religious twist that's continuing to pervade our national culture. Someone has said that much sentiment surrounding religion today may be compared to an old grandfather's clock. The clock is now a family heirloom. Everybody likes to have it around. No one seems to notice it, it fails to keep time. But nothing in the world could convince a family member to get rid of grandfather's clock. Indeed, it's polished and dusted regularly and has a place of honor in the living room. Yet no one today expects grandfather's clock to tell time or to regulate life. This search for an anchor or something we can count on to bring meaning to our life is ageless. The quest was as real in the first century as it is in the 21st century. What are you looking for? Jesus asks. No pithy parable here, no gentle discipling, but an interrogation more than anything else. During the course of Jesus' ministry, it would become blatantly evident just what some of his so-called followers were looking for. They were looking for it in John the Baptizer. They were looking for it in Jesus. And they continue looking for it today. As Jesus' reputation spread, throngs crowded around him with various diseases and ailments. They were looking for healing. As his popularity spread, the religious authorities began to question his theology and orthodoxy. They were looking for a fight. As his miracles increased, there were the hangers-on just there for the show. They were looking for entertainment. As his wisdom spread throughout Galilee and into Judea, there were seekers like the rich young ruler who tried to second guess his meanings. They were looking for an easy way into heaven. As his fame circulated and he became the talk of the town, there were lots of people with needs and wants who followed him. They were looking for the loaves and fishes. When Jesus went off by himself to the mountains and became lost in prayer, his disciples interrupted him. Everyone is looking for you. H. George Anderson, a Lutheran bishop, said, People are hungry for God, yet are settling for spiritual junk food. Yes, people are searching. Many are looking for Jesus, the Son, for the living Spirit of God in their lives, even though many may not realize it. But where are we looking? Collections of ceramic Jesus junk can't fill that void. Bags of crystals won't answer the need. All the newest spiritual books fail to fill the emptiness inside us. The answer to Jesus' soul-searching question what are you looking for cannot be bought in a shopping mall. Each one of us has a hole in our heart that only God can fill. The ancient cry of St. Augustine must become our cry. Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless 
until they find their rest in thee. Jesus knew there would be lots of wrong reasons given, as well as wrong pathways taken in our spiritual search. Our world abounds today, as then, with persons who are following a counterfeit Christ. Discovering the Spirit of God, the presence of Christ in our lives, will rarely be experienced as a burning bush or a blinding light. Growing a soul, filling our spirit with the right nourishment, is a day-to-day and week-to-week lifelong process. Sometimes it takes long years of sitting at the rabbi's feet, listening to his teachings, before we can kneel at the foot of the cross and claim discipleship. Perhaps we need to first ask, Teacher, teach us before we can confess, Jesus, save us. People are searching, looking here and looking there, and too many are looking in all the wrong wrong places. So no matter how you slice it, ultimately, at the bottom of it all, you're searching for something more, and that something more finally ends up with Christ. So perhaps that's why we've shared this time together today, that you are you on a spiritual pilgrimage? Are you on a mission to grow your soul? I pray that when we hear Jesus ask, what are you looking for? That we may gladly respond with the only answer that will ever truly satisfy I'm looking for Jesus, the Lamb of God who forgives the sin of the world, who forgives even me. To God be all honor, glory, and praise. Amen.